Hi everyone, welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week, and to sharing some practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and security nerd, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for March 25th, 2013. This was yet another busy week in security, so let's dive right in, starting with a lot of stories about attacks on point-of-sale locations, or places that take credit cards, essentially. During the week, there were a number of reports about new Trojans designed to steal credit card information from point-of-sale computers. There are two different stories. One was a Trojan found by McAfee called V-Skimmer, and another one was a Trojan found by a group called Group IB, which they called Black POS, but is also called a Dump Memory Grabber. Both of these were Trojans that were designed to infect Windows computers, and they checked the Windows computer to see if there was an attached card reader, credit card reader. If they found such a reader, they would try to capture and, and steal the data, the magnetic stripe data, sometimes called track one and track two data, that uh, you would get when you swipe these credit cards, and that could contain information like account numbers and expiration date and stuff like that. Once they gathered this sort of data, they then connected to a remote remote command and control server and shared this data with attackers. In fact, the vSkimmer malware also was able to share this data offline. If it couldn't connect to a command and control server, it could also detect if you put in a specially named USB storage device, and it would then store the data on that USB device, which suggests that these attackers created this malware also for insiders who were trying to leverage this particular attack. Anyways, these Trojans show attackers are putting more effort towards targeting point-of-sale systems. If you run a business that has point-of-sale systems, you should segment them from other untrusted areas of your network. Make sure only very trusted users have access to them, and make sure to use security controls like uh, gateway security devices, antivirus, local firewalls, and other security controls to try to keep malware off these systems. Let's move on and talk about some quick product security updates. There's two I want to talk about. The first is a bunch of Cisco iOS updates that I talked about earlier in the WatchGuard Security Center blog. Cisco's uh, semi-annual patch day falls on this month, and they release seven different Cisco iOS advisories. The advisories all differ technically, but they all fix denial of service vulnerabilities in the iOS operating system. This is the operating system that runs on most Cisco routers. These are fairly uh, significant flaws when you think about your gateway router. Denial of service flaws on your gateway router means that an attacker might be able to knock you offline for a period of time. So if you're a Cisco user, you should definitely go and check out these iOS advisories and install the proper updates and uh, implement the proper workarounds. On top of that, Google also released Chrome 26 to fix 11 different security vulnerabilities in the popular web browser. Two of the vulnerabilities are a pretty significant risk, four are a medium risk, and five are relatively low risk. Nonetheless, drive-by download attacks are a major vector right now. So if you use the Chrome browser, you definitely want to make sure to get the update. Hopefully you already have Chrome's automatic updates enabled. Another interesting story is a very targeted spear phishing campaign that spreads Android malware. I've talked about uh, different spear phishing campaigns targeting Tibetan activists. These are usually Chinese-based attackers trying to infect Tibetan activists' machines for various purposes, probably because of the political uh, a strife going on between Tibet and China right now. In any case, Kaspersky, one of WatchGuard's partners, identified a new spear phishing campaign targeting Tibetan activists that was sending a piece of Android malware. Tibetan activists would receive a very targeted email that contained a APK file attachment. And if you know Android, APK files are uh, software installer files. If you open this email on an Android device and click the attachment, it would install a conference app on your, your Android device. And if you ran that conference app, it would open up a text window talking about a, a conference that these activists might be interested in. But behind the scenes, this malicious application 
application was actually uh, stealing your SMS logs, your contacts, information about your phone, and your geolocation data, and sending that back to the attackers. So it's a very interesting targeted campaign. Furthermore, it goes to prove that attackers really are heavily focusing on attacking Android devices. If you use an Android device, you better think about securing it. So let's end with the story that got the most media attention, the Spam House DDoS attack. Spam House is an organization that's been around for decades that identifies sources of spam, obviously. In fact, it's an organization we use to help improve the security intelligence of our own anti-spam products. CyberBunker is a hosting company, uh, but a lot of people suspect that CyberBunker is what's called a bulletproof hosting company. Uh, they're a hosting company that's okay with hosting illegitimate services on the internet, including command and control uh, servers for malware, uh, and also pirate sites and things like that. Whether or not CyberBunker really is doing this sort of hosting, Spamhouse did add their IP address to their block sites list. And because of this, uh, CyberBunker is alleged to have started to DDoS Spamhouse. And this DDoS actually started a while ago, back on March 18th. And it started as pretty normal DDoSs, ones that generated maybe 10 gigabits of, of traffic. Long story short, they were eventually able to create a DDoS that generated 300 gigabits per second uh, of traffic. So this is a very, very significant DDoS. In fact, this is the, as far as anyone knows, the largest recorded DDoS that we've ever seen. What's also interesting is how these attackers launch their DDoS. Typically, attackers can use botnets, you know, uh, big networks of infected victims, sometimes thousands to millions of infected victims to launch DDoS attacks. But even these bot networks are somewhat limited in, in how big an attack they can generate. But in this case, the attackers use something called DNS amplification. Attackers can take advantage of these DNS specific uh, attributes to make small bits of traffic end up creating bigger bits of traffic. And by pointing their botnets at open DNS resolvers on the internet, they're able to greatly amplify the attack, which is probably what led to these 300 gigabit per second attacks. So in any case, the attack happened, and many of the media organizations are reporting that it almost broke the internet. In reality, a lot of people in the US anyways wouldn't have noticed this attack. The attack did generate a lot of uh, traffic in some European internet exchanges, especially the London internet exchange, and it might have slowed down some Europeans web browsing, but it didn't break the internet. Nonetheless, a 300 gigabit per second DDoS attack is something to take notice of. Now that attackers are able to sustain such large bandwidth attacks, it is more likely that they can have a significant effect on many, many businesses. So what can you do? Well, first of all, what's interesting about a DDoS amplification attack is it takes advantage of open DNS resolvers. There's DNS servers on the internet that let anybody uh, make any sorts of uh, DNS requests to them. They're called recursive DNS servers. And many experts think recursive DNS servers should be limited only to the users or the customers that they're intended for, not to the whole world. So one step uh, security experts think you should take is to make sure you don't have any open DNS resolvers on the internet. There's something called the Open Resolver Project, which has identified 27 million of these open resolvers. I recommend you go to their site and search your IP space to make sure you're not one of the ones with an open resolver on the internet. So this was an interesting attack, and it does go to show that DDoS attacks of the future may continue to get bigger if we don't come together as an internet community and try to uh, take away some of the insecurity that these attackers are leveraging to use our DNS servers against us. So that's it for this video. There's actually a number of other really interesting stories this week, so be sure to check the reference section of the WatchGuard Security Center post associated with this video. For that matter, be sure to visit WatchGuard Security Center regularly as I always post other stories there as well. And you can also follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.